Is your debt causing you sleepless nights? Knock your debt out with Debt KO. And your debt won't be the only thing keeping you up at night. Debt KO, free impartial advice on all your debt. Oscar Bevis, IFL TV, MTK Global. Delighted to be joined by Mr. Eddie Hearn once again. How are you, Ed? Very good, thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. I'm going to jump straight in because I know you've got some other things to do with Sky, etc. Um, are we in that classic narrative this week that Billy Joe doesn't get up for big fights? Martin Murray's always in shape. He looks in, well, looks in tremendous shape. He's been in camp with Jamie, blah, blah. Um, it's a hurdle for Billy Joe, is it? That sort of narrative again? I think it's just the truth, isn't it? You know, Billy Joe's last performances haven't been great. His last two. Um, you saw with Daniel Jacobs against Gabe Brasado last week, you know, a guy who almost looked like he couldn't get himself up for a fight. You've got to get yourself up for this fight. You've got to put on a performance. And he's up for it, Billy Joe. You know, and Martin Murray, yeah, you're right. You know, never boxed for a world title in the UK before. You know, he talks with so much passion, doesn't he, about Oliver Harrison and how much they're putting into this fight. Last roll of the dice. And just speaking to the team, they believe they're going to do it. You know, I think they look at Billy Joe and the question marks of Billy Joe is, you know, how's his discipline been? Is he in shape? Does he really want it anymore? And you've got to ask him all those questions in the fight. But it's if Murray can do it. And you've got to do it from the first round. You know, you can't start slow. And, you know, he's, he's in some fights, he talked about the Arthur Abraham fight where he says, I look back and just think, ah, oh, you know, those last few rounds, I just should have done a little bit more. And he can't have that regret waking up on Saturday morning. They believe they can win. I want a dominating performance from Billy Joe. I want, you know, I remember watching the Lemieux fight thinking, fuck me, this guy's good. I want people to say the same thing because if they say that on Saturday morning, the demand for Andrade, for Jacobs, for Canelo, Callum Smith, all these fights become bigger and that's what we want. You talk about the demand for the Callum Smith fight and um, obviously we've ended up now with Bill and Martin Murray and Callum's ended up getting the big one with Canelo but was you surprised from a fan perspective that there wasn't more demand? I thought like that was a fight that would be pushed by everyone and you'd almost be forced into it because of the demand for Billy and Callum. It just didn't seem as there as it should be because that is probably, bar Fury AJ, the best domestic fight you could get in this country. I think the demand's there, but it's not a fight with uh, you know bad blood, with a lot of hype, with a lot of animosity. It's just two good guys who respect each other, happen to be world super middleweight champions. So I think in boxing... That's a big fight, but you know, to the the wider audience, you know, maybe there isn't enough hype. But that fight would have taken place this year if there were crowds. You know, it sells out the O2, it sells out Manchester Arena. You know, it was a pay per view fight. We would have had, you know, the the money to make that fight. But instead, like you say, um, I mean, I feel for Billy Joe because some people say, "When's Billy Joe going to have the big fights?" It's just he had the big fight. You know, he agreed the fight with Canelo Alvarez. He flew to uh, Los Angeles. For the press conference. And a day later, unfortunately, this thing called COVID hit and the whole thing was off. So it's been a rough ride for him. And we're so frustrated because I want to deliver these guys at the prime of their careers the chance to create the legacy, to try and you know, be in those history, uh, those defining fights. And that's why I'm so pleased for Callum because he was so desperate right now for the big chance and he got it. Now, the next fight for Billy, if he comes through Martin Murray, he's got to be able to do the same thing. But the pressure in this fight is if he doesn't look good, there won't be the demand for those kind of fights. Suddenly, the broadcast will say, no, no, forget about Billy Joe, actually. What about someone else? If you can come out and look sensational, all of a sudden, the broadcast will say, yeah, Billy Joe against him. So this is a big moment for him. Does it make it the biggest night of his career then, would you say? Uh, you know, he's had some big nights, hasn't he? I mean... You know, the Andy Lee win was a, was a massive night. I think you have to say that was the biggest night of his career. And probably the Lemieux fight. You know, but defeat would be disastrous for Billy Joe Saunders. And a poor performance would be disastrous as well. You know that Billy Joe's not everyone's cup of tea, is he? So people are just waiting and dying to get on his back. And anything but a great performance, people will get on his back. So I don't think he's one of those guys that feels the pressure in that way. But... You know, for a lot of people on this card, there's probably three fights on this card, which is Billy Joe Saunders, which is Lerone Richards and Zach Parker, where really there's as much pressure to look good as there is to win. Because if you don't look good in this game, if you don't make people want to watch you, you're in big trouble. So Lerone, you know, he's just signed a deal with us. He's just fighting an eight-rounder. So we know what it is. It's just a run out for him. 
But the minute you don't look good, oh, he's overrated, that geezer. Oh, why have they signed him? You know, same with Zach Park. Oh, he's mandatory for Billy Joe. Rubbish. Billy Joe wins on points, don't look good. Oh, he's useless, that Billy Joe. So you've got to give people an excuse to say he's top draw. Yeah, there's a little theme of super middleweights from the undercard yeah, return of Shannon Billy, Courtney Billy as well. Joe's yeah, and a couple of Billy Joe's boys as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Billy Joe drives me bonkers. I mean, you've got Lewis Edmondson couldn't get a fight, so we've had to give him one on our card. You've got Dante Dixon, who is very, very good. Uh, he's on the card as well. Um, and there's plenty of others that I'm sure he'll be signing in the future. But he does... Billy is a boxing man through and through. Sometimes he puts a little bit too much energy into those guys. It's good for them. But as Mark Tibb said, you know, focus on your career. You're in the prime of your career. These, these, these next two years for Billy Joe, he's got to make it count because... How many people have you met who say Billy Joe is the one? You know, pound for pound, the best fighter in Britain. Well, let's see it. We saw it against Lemieux, but now we want to see it 168 pounds. Ed, great news. A thousand fans, just yes. a thousand. I know AJ's well, had 89,000 more than that, but uh, yeah. Get the tickets, yeah. Um, you know, there was part of me at one stage that said, you know, should we just leave it? But we, we have a responsibility to bring fans back. We've got to keep pushing the boundaries to try and return to normality. So we've got 1,000 tickets. We could have sold 70,000 tickets. The phone, I'm talking about the office line, my mobile, all day, non-stop. Ed, Ed, just four, keep us four, keep us six. Don't work like that, mate. The tickets are being sold by somebody else. Everything's being governed, reported. We can't get this wrong. You know, if we mess this up, if something goes wrong on the night, if, you know, the, the rules aren't followed, everybody takes a step backwards. And we must keep taking steps forward. So massive that we can get a thousand people back. Um, they're going to be very lucky, the ones that get it. Um, tickets go on sale on Friday. Is it like a, are you going to the Wimbledon style with a ballot and then that's it? It's just, it it's, listen, we're going to get so much stick. We've kept the prices exactly the same as they would have been if it was, you know, the O2 or whatever. I don't feel like, you know, we've taken liberties or anything. It's not about the money. It's about bringing people back to say we can do it. Right, because this is really important for not just us, but for other promoters and small hall boxing as well. This gives them a chance to bring back the small hall shows as well, and we can't balls it up. So um, it will be first come, first served, and everyone will call me an arsehole afterwards. But there's no there's no other way around it. So um, you know you have to come from the same household. You have to prove that on the night as well and show your ID, um, and we have to police it and it's not going to be easy. It's going to be expensive almost to provide that kind of logistics to make it count, but we have to make it count and we have to do this. We have to bring fans back and it's important that we do it for an AJ event. Those thousand fans going to see the Gypsy King at ringside? I believe so. I was just talking to Adam Smith about it. I think you know, a few broadcasters trying to get him there. He's more than welcome as well to come down and watch. Um, and hopefully from there, we see a great Anthony Joshua performance and then we see... The fight getting made, maybe even live on TV, would be nice. But you know, if he if he wants that fight, he should you know he should come down, he should watch, and you know, we're hundred percent committed to making that fight, subject to AJ winning against Pulev on December twelfth. I mean, it would be a good statement to see, obviously, Tyson ringside, and then maybe I don't know if he can jump in the ring with rules or whatever. Probably not, yeah. but uh, it would be a good statement. Would that sort of put something forward that you want to set something in, in concrete before the end of the year? We want to do it ASAP. You know, I don't want to. Um, jinx anything but hopefully through victory on the 12th and which I, I don't think there's no games to be played it's not I'm not coming down there because you know, we're, we're all working together we're trying to give the public this fight so AJ would love Fury to be there hopefully Fury wants to be there because we all want, we want to get it done With no games you know not oh you come down and it might mean this it might we're not worried about that let's just get it done we all agree on the deal let's start working together let's get the date in place but most importantly just win on December 12th because without that it's all completely irrelevant I can see already the sky cameras panning in to Tyson once yeah, Joshua yeah. knocks out Pulev but uh, I know you said to me before everyone takes a mic how you I spoke to AJ yesterday have you spoke to him recently is, is he ready I spoke to him last night I just spoke to him just now on a Zoom call with the media he's, um, he's good he's nervous you know we're all nervous because is that a good thing it's a really good thing and I said that to him last night he said you know I'm good I'm, you know the pressure's on isn't it I think he said to me I said yeah fucking too right mate but that's what we want the pressure, you didn't feel the pressure when you boxed Andy Ruiz. Now we feel the pressure because you're in a tough fight and one win 
gives you a shot at the undisputed. So that's, that's what's on the line, and uh, he'll be razor sharp. I think you're going to see a brilliant performance from him. The Warren Joyce, I know you've done like a little wrap-up of events with Coogan, obviously over the last few days, the aftermath sort of deepened on Daniel Dubois. Um, at 23 years old, I know Coogan said this year as well, at 23 years old, it's probably quite hard to take on the chin, but uh, yeah, just your thoughts on how the last couple of days have panned out, I suppose, from, from Daniel's perspective. I think um, a loss is a loss. You know, it doesn't matter how it comes. Um, again, you know, I saw Frank's comment saying, oh, Eddie Hearn says we're lying. I didn't say you were lying. I just said that Coogan said they'd fracture his cheekbone. I said, oh, I haven't seen any reports or scans. I'm not asking to see him. He said, well, it's got nothing to do with me anyway. And, you know, when people talk about, you've got, you got the boxing, the boxers saying, oh, he quit. He don't want to fight anymore. He's mentally weak. And then you've got the sensible people saying he made a good decision, right? So did he quit? Yeah, but it was a sensible quit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it was thinking about maybe about the future, I don't know, or maybe he didn't want to be in there anymore. But this is a tough sport and these fighters deserve all the respect. You can't just expect them to go in and do what you want to do all the time. But most of the criticism has come from the fighters, not necessarily from the armchair fans. Um, Dubois is a very good fighter. He will come again. You know, again, if, if I mean, I know I'm not questioning Frank. Frank says he's fractured his cheekbone. He'll need an operation and he'll be out for a year or so, if that's the case. And, you know, that is a bad injury. But he will definitely come again. He'll learn from that. And those kind of experiences at that level... I mean, look, when AJ... I was watching AJ against uh, Dillian White the other night. I mean, when you watch the two fights in comparison, they were very similar at the time to where they are. AJ against Dillian White, I feel it was levels and levels above the Dubois-Joyce fight. But... AJ could have lost that fight. You know, he got carried away, lost his marbles, and he didn't. He come through, and Dillian White got beat in that fight. He got knocked, back, knocked out. Look where he went on, what he went on to achieve. Many people after that fight might have said, oh, Dillian White won't go on and win British titles. Well, he's, you know, he's about, hopefully, going to beat Povetkin and get a shot at the world title. So you could never count yourself out, especially at that age. Um, you know, he's, he's got a close family. He's got, you know, a good team around him. And I'm sure he'll be back. But it's going to take a lot of rebuilding. And for Joe Joyce, you know, I still kind of think that people aren't really giving Joe. It's all about, did Dubois quit? Does he want, you know, it's not, well done, Joe Joyce. What a great performance. I didn't think he'd win. I thought he might do if it went five or six rounds. But it was so one-sided, the fight. He just, he dominated the fight. And um, he was always in control, wasn't he? Just very calm, very unassuming. Even when he was in the change room after, was you there or was it uh, Uma? He was like, you know, wasn't he? He's just, he's, he's like that, which is, which is good. And, it, and that enabled him to put that kind of performance together. I know what you mean. It's almost like he couldn't contemplate the fact yeah. that he just won. Um, but, he, but he expected to win. It's just, that's Joe, you know. I remember with Joe, I was going to sign him once and I gave him a big pitch. And it was a really good pitch, you know, and you're selling something to someone. And I finished and we were in the Starbucks in Sheffield. I'll never forget. And he just looked at me and he went, all right. And I was like, is that all? All right, I've just given you the best sales pitch of all time. And it didn't work out. But, you know, I wish him all the best, and he's a very good fighter. And him and Usyk's picking up a bit of steam as well on social media. People sort of almost believe that Joe's strengths and perhaps lie in Usyk's weaknesses, and obviously the rematch from amateur days in the WSB. So there's a little bit there as well. Yeah, good fight. I mean, we see what happens with the WBO title. I think that fight's the same kind of thing, isn't it? Uh, You'd fancy Usyk to really outbox Joe Joyce, but Joe's pressure, his strength, you know, will be very interesting in that fight. So Joe, Joe's a bit of a nightmare for everybody, really. Again, he, you don't, I said before, you don't watch him and think it's the second coming of Ali, but he can really fight and he's, he's strong and powerful and, you know, he's going to be a problem for a lot of heavyweights. You mentioned Povetkin and Dillian. Um, I saw a tweet that said Povetkin's sort of out and training again. Um, 30th, is that sort of yeah. set? That's very much the, the plan. I don't, you know, I don't want to get to a situation where we announce the 30th and then in two weeks' time he says, oh, can I have another two weeks? So we're just speaking to Andre Rybinski and Vadim Kornlov and the World of Boxing team just to make sure they're happy with that date. I think if there is a delay, you are talking two or three weeks maximum. But right now they're focusing on January the 30th, so are we, and he's resumed training. He hasn't, he hasn't gone ham yet, but... He's about to, and we hope that he passes those tests and those levels and says we're good to go. Just finally, Ed, I know you're going to speak to Coogan at 
Joshua Pulev, and I'm sure you do some Zooms over the yeah. Christmas period when boxing's over, but we've had a good couple of months, haven't we, yeah. since the boxing restart. Uh, just a little reflection on this time. Do you think it's gone well? I feel like boxing's almost bigger than it was before. I don't know. Yeah, I think we've, we've all done really well. I mean, you know, and it, uh, fight camp, the bubble here, and, you know, some Frank, uh, Aram, Heyman, um, everyone, Golden Boy, everyone's dug in. Hennessy, you know, everyone's, golden yeah, Golden Contract, MTK. You know, and I think, although we're not fighters, I think we've got it in us, in a, in a business sense, where we say, right, we've got to dig in here, we've got to roll up our sleeves and we've got to crack on. And boxing was able to do that. And when we come out, this is going to be the last, hopefully, the last event of our lifetime behind closed doors. Right? But I've enjoyed it. You know, I've enjoyed the experience. I've learned a lot. And I feel like when we go back to normality, we'll be bigger and stronger than ever. So I think everybody in boxing should give themselves a big pat on the back and the fans as well for staying tuned and staying locked. You guys for, for dishing out the content non-stop as well. And it's been a frustrating period, but it's been a good period. I've got to say, you know, I was traveling every other week, right? And I haven't flown to America since February. I've spent so much time with the family, at times they've driven me berserk. But I've, had, I've been, even during this, I would say, possibly, this has been the happiest year of my life. Do you know what I mean? Even with no crowds, with all the aggravation, because I've been able to actually do some normal things, and I've enjoyed it. So it just shows you, don't take things too seriously, stay in the hustle, stay in the grind, but get the balance right. So next year we'll be going ham again and I'll be away every week, but I'm okay because I'm retest, I'm, you know, I'm um, rested re rather and I'm ready to go. So I'm as motivated as ever, but I've enjoyed this year. I've enjoyed the challenge. You know, COVID has been a nightmare for everybody and us, but I feel like everyone in boxing, like I said, has rolled their sleeves up and cracked on and I think they've done a great job. Is your debt causing you sleepless nights? Knock your debt out with Debt KO. And your debt won't be the only thing keeping you up at night. Debt KO, free impartial advice on all your debt.